Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for introducing me and inviting me to this conference. And until we have suspended animation, I think we need to continue to uh, get the oxygen delivery controlled and still use blood product to maintain oxygen delivery so the patient can buy some time until the hospital reach. So, um, who am I? Well, I'm a huge fan and believer of history, and I'm a huge fan and believer of experience. And I'm a huge fan of uh, basic physiology and common sense. And all these four together sometimes uh, supersedes randomized controlled trial as the only thing valuable for changing policy and pre-hospital interventions. Uh, so, uh, since there has been so much talk about um, airway management, uh, I'll show you a video on how we teach our medics in the special forces in Norway to, to uh, fix the airway. And it's uh, fairly easy. So you can just, just the, say the tactical airway flip. It's very easy. <laughs> Positioning. Gravity is your only airway management tool. So, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the rationale for pre blood transfusion and I have a kind of a holistic view. Uh, and since James Blundell in 1818 uh, transfused human blood to a um, uh, obstetric patient, uh, the patients uh, have been bleeding whole blood uh, during the First World War, during the Second World War, during the Korean War, and during the Vietnam War. After the Vietnam War, patients started bleeding components, and they have been bleeding components ever since. <laughs> so now we are giving reconstructed, deconstructed whole blood instead of giving whole blood as a one-to-one -one resuscitation approach. So uh, this is uh, another word for uh, traumatic coagulopathy is actually just call it blood failure because that's what it is. And that is also the holistic view of this that you uh, basically have to, to replace the loss with what patients have lost. So uh, I am also a huge fan of quotes. Uh, so remember this is three stages of scientific discovery. First people deny it's true. Then the uh, is important, and finally the credit the wrong person. And this is also uh, uh, correct for uh, scientific rediscovery. So uh, we are just rediscovering what we have been kind of having for, for years and, and centuries. And, and also I want to present you the tombstone for crystalloids. Uh, their time has come and gone. I, I finally hope they're gone forever. So. Uh, we have a goal that is to improve survival of patients with life threatening bleeding, and I'm talking about a very, very small portion of our traumatic patients that represent in the civilian world like 2 to 3% of the trauma patients are massively transfused. Uh, in a military setting, uh, this number is much, much higher. So 10 to 20% of trauma patients on the battlefield are massively transfused. That means 5 to 10 times uh, more often is done on the battlefield. And remember, military transfusion medicine has had a huge impact on civilian uh, transfusion medicine for the last 100 years. So just going to introduce you, the, we have a research group in Bergen that is attached to the TOUR network, Trauma, Homostasis and Oxygenation Research Network, that we have a conference in Bergen in June every year, and we have the eighth conference this June. Uh, and we, uh, we have a Blood Far Forward group in uh, Bergen uh, uh, that we link uh, blood professors uh, to anesthesiologists and, uh, and lab doctors and medical students uh, to see if we can improve uh, the way to get blood as far forward as possible. So uh, I'll just give you a short information on the trauma, the tour network that I am co-chairing together with Phil Spinella. Uh, and we are actually a multidisciplinary group all from, from uh, medical uh, uh, first responders to, to scientists and critical care docs, uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists, uh, to try to kind of come together uh, every year and and discuss how to improve survival of exsanguinating patient in the pre-hospital arena. Uh, so we advocate for either fresh whole blood or cold stored whole blood as the optimal choice of hemorrhage shock, and also use TXA as an adjunct, uh, and a balanced blood component if fresh whole blood or cold stored whole blood is not feasible. Uh, disclaimer, uh, we don't have to read it. Uh, 
my only disclaimer would be that I, I'm on the side of Mother Nature. She found, she, she's funding me, no, nobody else. So I think we should focus on the gas of life. This is actually everything we do in the pre hospital care phase is actually to focus on. If we can maintain ocean delivery, uh, you will uh, definitely well, do the best you can to have a, a, a live patient arriving at the emergency room. And a live patient is a good thing for the surgeons, and the better preserved they are, the better uh, chances of success the uh, surgeons will have. Uh, and, and once again, everything that has been said has already been said, so since you was no, n nobody was listening, I hope, I hope you listen today, uh, so I don't have to say it again. Uh, and also, uh, another quote that's going to go into history uh, uh, is one of our collaborators, uh, who is a hematologist, by the way, uh, that is not very fan of crystal at all. So, uh, just to go back to the history, uh, and remember, this is a paper from 1918, uh, where they discovered the transfusion of whole blood in a checkinating patient, and that is kind of a huge discovery at that time. Uh, so, I think this could easily be been written uh, today, uh, but it was written 100 years ago, and it's still valid. Uh, so, remember, World War II, uh, there were millions of units of whole blood transfused. Uh, it was cold stored. Uh, there were no blood warmers at the time. Uh, I guess you don't know when the blood, came, blood warmer came in, but that was in 1967. Uh, so they were choosing cold uh, blood, and by the end of the war, 500,000 units of whole blood was transported the last year of the war from U.S. to the battlefield in Europe. They also discovered uh, a couple of transfusion reactions, hemolytic transfusion reactions, due to, to incompatible plasma in group O whole blood. So they started to titer the whole blood to measure the uh, amount of antibodies in the plasma on whole blood and started using low titer whole blood. And the, the problem disappeared. And that was the definition of, of the universal whole blood, which still people don't believe we can give it as a universal. And Korean War. Same thing happened. 400,000 400, units of whole blood was transfused, and with it was all group O. It was all group O, and there was no severe hemolytic transfusion reaction re uh, at that time in, in those 400,000 units. And still, most protocol cells and most blood bank will tell you that you, you have to give type-specific whole blood, which actually only increases the chances of a severe hemolytic uh, transfusion reaction uh, because one of the most important failure that happens is you give wrong blood to the wrong patient. It's called a major ABO mismatch. Uh, also in Korea, the average uh, time from point of injury to the emergency room was two and a half hour. And if you read those papers, a uh, patient massively transfused, it averaged 7.5 liters of cold stored whole blood, received more than 50% of that blood prior uh, to surgery, means that 50% of the blood was given pre hospital and in the emergency room, and the average time from point of injury to surgery starts with seven hours, and the case fatality rate in those patient population was 21%, and that is basically better than we have in our own university hospital at the moment with massively transfused patients. So they did good. Uh, same uh, happened in Vietnam, uh, same stuff. They used uh, whole blood. Uh, far forward, they'll use group O, low titer whole blood, and after Vietnam era, we had the crystalloid era that actually lasted for the last at least 40 years. Uh, we don't know any randomized controlled trials that was proving that it was superior than anything else. So there's a paradigm shift, and you have to wonder, how did we get there? Uh, and that is another quote. Uh, we didn't read our history. Uh, we forgot to read all those good papers that has been written since 18, 1918 and up till now. Uh, so uh, during World War I, this was introduced as the fluid of choice saved, uh, saved uh, thousands of lives. No random or controlled trials were before they started using it, and we still use it. Penicillin started in World War II as well. No random or controlled trials to prove that penicillin was uh, better than sulfur, but we still use penicillin. 
Freeze-dried plasma was introduced in World War II. They used 10 million units of freeze-dried plasma during World War II without any randomized control up front. And we still use it. And today, the US DOD has spent so far $200 million to have an FDA-approved freeze-dried plasma product because they sold their freeze-dried product line to the French, who still produce freeze-dried plasma. And actually, at the moment, they send plasma from the US, make freeze-dried plasma in France, and they use it on the battlefield for US soldiers. So it's interesting. Components was introduced also without any randomized controlled trials. No randomized controlled trials was done to see if uh, components one to one to one or components like red cells and crystalline was superior to what they used before, like, like whole blood. Uh, blood was reintroduced, uh, especially pre-hospital. You can see a slide from them later on. There was no randomized controlled trials that made that change. Uh, so, uh, another historical change in approach was Murphy and Gardner's papers from 1969 that completely, one single paper, completely changed platelet transfusion and platelet storage. Actually, it was only based on in vitro studies and in vivo recovery and survival data. Uh, and uh, I normally recognize that most people, or ER docs and anesthesiologists, know very little about blood products. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, so if I ask them, do you know how places are made, or how places are stored, and why they are stored the way they are stored, and how they can store for, most people don't know, because they believe the thing that the blood bankers give them is good shit. <coughs> and sometimes it's shit, I'll tell you that. So uh, cold store platelets have better preserved mitochondrial respiration aggregation. We've known that since the early 1960s, and we have been transfusing cold store platelets for 100 years. Still, we, we, we store those platelets at room temperature. We store a cell on the kitchen table, and in Japan, you're allowed to store it for three days. In US, you're allowed to store it for five days. And in Europe, you're allowed to store it for seven days. You have your steak on your kitchen table for seven days and eat it? So we still use uh, room temperature stored places for bleeding. Uh, and since I told you about random control trials, I do a random control trial for myself, in a, not only for myself, but the BFF group in, in Bergen in cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, and we give them, either, uh, they, we randomize them into warm uh, platelets or cold platelets, and we have significant reduced bleeding in the cold stored platelet arm. So cold stored platelet work, you don't have any risk of uh, bacterial contamination at all, and probably you can store them for 14 days instead of only seven. So this is going to go into history as transfusion madness. So fresh milk stored at the kitchen table for seven days, nobody would be able to drink that. So I recommend you to con reconsider how you store your platelets when you give it to bleeding patients. So evidence doesn't drive uh, advances in trauma care. People do that. That's the same from Frank Butler. I really believe him. So. Uh, you might have a different opinion, but you can't have a different physiology. The physiology is the same. So uh, it looks like, if you look at the guidelines, I think the guidelines seems to me that they think that these patients have different physiology because the vision guidelines, European guidelines from 2016, oh, you give RBC to aim achieve a target of hemoglobin of seven to nine. Uh, and use crystalloids uh, in, in initiation of hypertensive bleeding patients. Well, the military guidelines, TCCC, they advocate for whole blood as the uh, uh, preferred uh, fluid of choice for hemorrhagic shock on the battlefield, and that has a hemoglobin of 12 to 13, uh, and basically that is an oxygen carrying capacity 40% higher than a hemoglobin of seven, and when the oxygen delivery is what you're dealing with, why wouldn't you give something that carries 40% more oxygen than this? Well, I don't know. That seems uh, very intuitively to me that that would be a good thing to do. So, uh, yeah, you need a certain asset. Your problem is you don't have one. So this is uh, like the remote area. Um, and we do damage control, and we call remote damage control is just putting DCR principles to the pre-hospital arena. So since we believe that uh, blood uh, is good to give in a hemorrhagic shock patient in the emergency room, it makes sense that might, that might work pre-hospital as well, uh, but still we have to do randomized control trials, so that would be like if ketamine works in the emergency room, uh, we have to do a trial to see if it works pre-hospital. Well, uh, oops, something happened. Thank you, sorry. So uh, what do we need to do? We need to uh, 
actually uh, add to the circulatory volume, aid oxygen delivery, and repra replace hemostatic potential and a few other things. That's the most important thing you do when you resuscitate. So what are we aiming for uh, in the RDCR uh, story? Well, maintain oxygen delivery above threshold for delivery-dependent oxygen consumption. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more what delivery-dependent oxygen consumption is. Uh, maintain support hemostasis to, use to reduce blood leak uh, because traumatic hemorrhagic shock increases the blood leak. So if you could prevent the blood leak uh, with something that actually has a hemostatic potential, uh, that would be a good thing. So the, the thing is that if you don't gain shock, you don't have coagulopathy. So should you prevent shock or treat shock? Probably the best thing to do is to prevent it. Uh, so that is uh, what we call this, instead of calling it coagulopathy, traumatic coagulopathy, blood failure, because when you bleed, you bleed red cells, so that the amount of red cells is decreased, so you have an RBC failure. Uh, basically, you have your platelets uh, hit the floor. That, that's another, you know, you know the word hit, heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia. You have another kind of hit, that's when the blood hits the floor. Uh, Endothelia failure, most important thing that the, actually your blood is enveloped by the largest organ in your body that has a surface area of 40,000 uh, quadrat meters, which is quite large, that communicates with all the cells in the blood. So you have to look at that as well. And immune failure and infection and, and blah, blah, blah. So if you, instead of uh, uh, looking uh, at this uh, separately, you should look at this as a a, a blood as an organ where the endothelium is part of that organ. Um, and that is also that hemorrhage causes oxygen depth that is the driver of the uh, coagulopathy. Uh, and by the end of the day, you reach this, the stage of blood failure, which we call traumatic coagulopathy. So this is uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, so I have to just try to see if you can understand this curve. This curve is called the curve of life. So. Uh, the speaker prior to me, uh, he tried to push that line to the left to decrease oxygen consumption. So this is your oxygen consumption at the basal level. The oxygen consumption you have when you sit in this room, which is above average 180 milliliters per, uh, per square meters. So for a normal individual, that would be almost be uh, 300 uh, milliliters of oxygen a minute. So if you start uh, decreasing your oxygen delivery by decreasing cardiac output, you will at, this, uh, at a point you will reach the critical level of oxygen delivery. Uh, and then your oxygen consumption decreases, not because your metabolism decreases, because the delivery is too low to maintain oxygen delivery. So where do you want to be on this curve? You want to be here or here or here. Uh, here is cardiac arrest. Uh, and here is where you want to be when you resuscitate them to the right side of that curve. So um, when you stay on the left side, you gain what calls oxygen depth. I mean, you, you ha don't have enough oxygen. So you cannot go into the bank and loan a million, mo a million dollars or kroner without paying them back. And so that will have, you have your debt, you have to repay it. The same thing is happening in traumatic hemorrhagic shock. You have to repay the oxygen debt. Uh, in here, that is where probably somebody's going to talk about that tomorrow. That's where ECMO comes in, uh, that you could probably be able to repay that oxygen depth quicker uh, and reverse coagulopathy quicker uh, if you can increase the oxygen delivery at a sufficient level using ECMO instead. So we know that shock is bad for you. That's, uh, nobody disagrees on that. And level of shock is correlated with outcome. There's a lot of papers on that. So uh, level of shock is also uh, correlated with level of coagulopathy and inflammation, but also level of blood failure. Uh, so that is the reason for your coagulopathy, the hyperperfusion and shock, oxygen depth, primary initiator. So I don't think nobody is going to invent a drug that's going to be able to reverse the uh, traumatic coagulopathy. Uh, the only way to uh, reverse it is to increase the oxygen delivery so far. So these are the compensation mechanism, uh, and in bleeding patient, the cardiac output is your main problem, uh, tachycardia and low uh, blood pressure. And as you all know, blood pressure and pulse rate is very poor indicators of shock and not very useful, really. Uh, and just remember uh, that uh, this is the most basic physiology uh, equation there is, that blood pressure is a uh, cardiac output uh, uh, 
multiplied with systemic vascular resistance, which is important when we compare in hospital trials with pre hospital trials. Because a patient in, an, wait, patient in, how do we do that? Okay. So, this is the patient in anesthesia where you can maintain a low blood pressure at a much higher cardiac output, a much higher oxygen delivery. So it might be that permissive hypertension might work when you're in, in anesthesia. That not be the same in these patients who is severely vasoconstricted and a blood pressure of 80 to 90 would probably not mean that you have reversed the shock. So permissive hypertension is something we need to challenge uh, to see if that is really way, the way we want to go, uh, where's the evidence for permissive hypertension. So uh, I'll just tell you this, that red cell matters because it represents the bulk of the clot. And by the way, it carries oxygen. And you don't forget platelet adhesion. Platelet adhesion is important. If you want your platelets to work, the platelets work better the higher the hematocrit is, and it starts decreasing from a hematocrit of 40 and downwards. Uh, so if you have a bleeding patient that needs platelets, it would be a wise thing to do to have the rise the hemoglobin first because before you give your platelets. Oh, I know it's late, uh, so... Uh, you stay awake for a few more minutes, uh, and I'll let you go and have a drink in the bar and, um, and try to inhibit your platelets because alcohol is a nice platelet inhibitor. That's the race. So uh, this is the paper if you want to read about platelet adhesion and the importance of actually having a high hematocrit for your platelets to actually work. Uh, and um, this is just a mathematics. We know we don't do, do deal with mathematics in pre-hospital, but if you have a, if, you, if you're a shock, let's say your cardiac output is three liters a minute, you have a hemoglobin of 14 and an SpO2 of 98, your oxygen delivery is 551. With a hemoglobin of seven, which you know the European guidelines advocate for, uh, you have a DO2 of 275. Uh, so maintain obtainable VO2 hobbian of 40 is 385 per minute. That's above the threshold I told you. This is far below the threshold, meaning that if you're hypoperfusion and have a hemoglobin of seven, you're not able to survive. So uh, this is uh, a permissive hypertension, not a treatment. Maybe a necessary evil, but that's the evidence. Most of the evidence for this is made by uh, a lot of animal trials uh, that use crystalloid. It's the Bickel study that started this permissive hypertension. You have you ever, somebody have read the Bickel study? that started this permissive hypertensive approach? Who have read it? Well, the only thing it proves is that crystalloid increases mortality. It does not prove that permissive hypertension is a good thing. If you read it, it doesn't prove nothing else than crystalloid is bad. Uh, so what about delayed evacuation? You want to keep your systolic blood pressure for between 80 and 90 for hours? I don't think that's going to work. Uh, so there's done a lot of studies done this, and, and it looking at the survival in animal studies, and looks very poor. Uh, so the survival decreases over time. Uh, so it might be that we have to change this approach, and the approach has to be changed by using blood products instead of crystalloids. So this is another way of looking at it. Uh, so this will be the point of injury, and your DO2 starts decreasing while your aquatic output is decreasing. Uh, so, actively bleeding and you're compensating. Remember, in all elective surgery, you have a patient who bleeds a lot in elective surgery as well. You agree? If you do anechoic surgery, if you do liver transplant, whatever. So, where do you start resuscitation of these patients? Because below the red line, then you're in shock and you're actually, your oxygen delivery is not sufficient. You, you will actually acquire a lactacidosis. So uh, below the li red line is shock, above is not. So uh, do we wait until the patient is here or do you start here? Pre-hospital, we w always wait here. All guidelines tell you you have to wait until they're in shock. So here they're in shock. Here you resuscitate. And uh, uh, the red uh, is the dose of shock and the green is aerobic metabolism. So what you want to do, you want to reduce the dose of shock as early as possible as the shock dose is what's killing you. Uh, so if you have read this, uh, Isri's paper of more than four, it's like 5,000 patients arriving at the emergency room and you see mortality starts increasing from a systolic blood pressure of 100. And if you put these uh, base deficits, you see the same. Uh, 
So what these two slides tell you, if systolic blood pressure is below 100 upon arrival, you have gained oxygen depth shock. So why do we have to keep systolic blood pressure below uh, 90 uh, pre-hospital? Uh, because we want to have the patient gain shock. Um, so uh, this is another one that the golden oil policy was uh, uh, introduced by Gates in 2009. Uh, and if you look at the data here, that these are the data from 2009 up to now, and they have an epidemiologist who have got decomposed the data. But a lot of other things happened when they decreased uh, the transport time from point of injury to the emergency uh, room and the surgency in Afghanistan. So they started using blood on the helicopters. They had uh, better uh, protective gear. Uh, but if you look at this, two-thirds is about time and blood. So 40% of the reduction in killed in action is due to blood transfusion pre-hospital. Uh, so Question is, is it all about shock or all about coagulopathy or maybe both? Well, shorter evac time, that reduces the shock dose. And if you choose blood that carries oxygen, it reduces the shock dose and time and blood improves survival. Uh, so pre-hospital blood for hemostatic resuscitation, it all tells you it's too hard to do, we can't do it, uh, how you want to get the blood out to the soldiers. Uh, so uh, in the Norwegian Naval Special Operations Forces, I was working there for seven years as a senior medical officer. We have actually transported cold, uh, cold storage group O whole blood on every mission since 2013. Uh, and uh, we have a new CPG for the Norwegian Armed Forces that said that whole blood group O low titer as the preferred resuscitation fluid for dramatic shock, and that is for all uh, the entire force. And we do transport them in golden ore boxes. We can have it in our medic bag, or we can transport it to the surgical field in these golden ore bags that don't, do does not require any power supply. This one can uh, hold for seven days without power supply with a temperature of 46 degrees. The smaller box is uh, 24 hours uh, at least. Uh, so th we have done this now uh, since 2015. We have shipped cold stored whole blood from our blood bank to Afghanistan without breaking the cold chain. So if, if we can do that, I think you can put uh, blood on your helicopter and start resuscitating your, your traumatic hemorrhage patient with blood instead of, of something that doesn't work. And this is also something that happened in Norway. Uh, this is all the air ambulance uh, bases in Norway uh, that in 2012 all used clear fluids and without any randomized controlled trials something happened. They changed the approach. Kaboom! There's only one now that doesn't carry blood products and uh, he, that helicopter is actually covering uh, an area that is uh, bigger than uh, uh, Denmark. Uh, so I'd advocate for them to uh, start thinking of it. And this is a walking blood bank in one of our platforms. They actually have a walking donor pool on the platform because it's three hours flight out and three hours flight in. And if you start bleeding on that platform, I basically don't think that you could recover that patient with saline. Uh, so they have a walking blood bank uh, uh, as the same as the Royal Caribbean Cruise Liners. Who has been on a cruise with Royal Caribbean Cruise Liners? They transport 20 million uh, passengers a year. They have a walking uh, uh, blood bank concept on their uh, 32 cruise ships. They have transfused now since 2010 100 patients with fresh whole blood on board with a minimum transport time from where they re receive this patient in their doctor's office until they are at a treatment facility more than 24 hours. The majority of the patient is GI bleeds in shock, but they also have three extra uterine gravi gra gravities. Uh, they all survived, so they have like a 90 to 95 percent survival with a walking blood bank uh, on board. So uh, we need optimal resuscitation product uh, for trauma-induced failure. Mortality is high, even children is higher. Uh, it occurs fast. So at the moment, whole blood is an FDA-approved product, and the EU re regulative uh, tells you also that uh, whole blood is allowed to use. Uh, but in some of the countries uh, in Europe, like Germany and Switzerland, it's like if you say the word whole blood, the blood banker will go bananas and say, are you crazy, totally malfunctioned. I don't know what you're talking about. We don't use whole blood. So it can be stored for up to 35 days, uh, 400 to 500 mils per unit and preferably for pre-hospital use, use low target group O.
that's the optimal product. Uh, warm fresh whole blood is uh, different. That is for the walking donor pool that has been used. And we've been using walking donor pools in Iraq and Afghanistan in all wars since the uh, World War I. Uh, so far, 12,000 units of fresh whole blood has been transfused in Afghanistan without any lethal transfusion reaction so far. Uh, so uh, there was barriers to this. You must be ABO specific. You cannot look at reduce it without uh, losing places. That's not true. And uh, like cold places are not functional. That is not true either, uh, because cold places are really more functional than room temperature places. So uh, whole blood uh, barriers have disappeared. Uh, so uh, this is now a standard product. Uh, the AABB uh, regulators have changed, so it's now allowed to give. Uh, cold stored group O low tower whole blood in the US, and they are starting using it now in, in several uh, helicopter platforms. They start using this at BAMC, they have used whole blood in, U in Utah, so a lot of uh, level one surgical facility have now started uh, changing their approach. Instead of one to one to one, they give whole blood. So uh, this is a new AB standard that changed uh, due to the tour network and ABB uh, collaborating group. Uh, so this is what the one of the things that the tour network has accomplished. Uh, uh, so this is the resuscitation paradigm. You have to give it early, uh, and soon thereafter, a goal-directed hemostatic resuscitation. If you think goal direction uh, and using TEG and RODAMs and stuff like that will help you, uh, I will not take that discussion here and now. Just remember, this is a component therapy 111. Uh, that actually is much, much more diluted than a, a bag of whole blood. This has a hematocrit of 29, this has a hematocrit of 38 to 50, platelet from 150 to 400, this has a platelet of 80, and this has 100% coagulation uh, factors, this is 65. So all hemodiluted product. And we know from previous, if you read the old stuff, uh, even from the World War II stuff, they recognized that hemodilutions will say something that killed patients. So they advocated for, if you give freeze-dried plasma, never give more than a thousand cc's of freestyle plasma because patients receiving more than that are too hemodiluted when they come in and it's much harder to re reverse their shock than if they start whole blood early. So this is uh, like, so you give a lot of crystalloids when you give one to one to one, you give much more crystalloids than if you give a whole blood unit. Uh, so uh, to sum up, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, so um, I'll say, as Kevin Ward say, the main thing to keep the main thing, the main thing, the main thing. So uh, uh, hemoglobin matters in low flow states. Hemoglobin matters for platelet adhesion. You have to reverse shock as early as possible because if you're not able to reverse the shock, you will have increased uh, increase, uh, uh, potential of dying from your increased shock dose on coagulopathy. Uh, permissive hypertension, I will at least question is if that is a good idea. Um, early platelet transfusion, we know that early platelet transfusion uh, improves survival uh, and platelets is important for clot formation and clot strength. Uh, and plasma repairs the glucocalis, the outer layer of the endothelium. Uh, and you need to have a holistic view on this. So uh, instead of uh, giving components, so you may consider giving the whole thing in one package. And remember, you have to spike one bag instead of three bags. And the only way to have a perfect timing uh, of a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one resuscitation strategy is to have all in one bag. It's really, I've never been able to time that correctly because you're either waiting for the plasma to be thawed or you're waiting for the platelets to come and then when you're waiting for that, you get the red cells and then the plasma comes. So you're never able to time it correctly. Uh, so, uh, just saying this, blood is for bleeding, salt will receive for cooking pasta. We have t-shirts, we say t-shirt saves lives, the same on the same on the same on the back of my t-shirt. And it's time for consideration. If you have all these guidelines, glass of coma scale below 8, I say it's time for consideration, not intubation. And don't cling to a mistake just because you spend a lot of time making it. So, don't disconnect the heart-lung machine prior to surgery. Keep the spontaneous breathing if possible. That will be what I would suggest to you if you want to have a topic for next year. Uh, have ventilation strategies for patient in hemorrhagic shock and uh, ask yourself the question why do we, do we have to normal ventilate a patient in hemorrhagic shock and why do we normal, normal ventilate patient in during CPR? Why do we do that? Is there any reason to normal ventilate a patient that only have 1.5 liters going through the lungs a minute uh, and does circulation and ventilation? Is that linked together? Is those two separate? 
So uh, randomized controlled trial or non-physiology experience observation or common sense or maybe both. I guess maybe both will be the best. And uh, I'll stop with this one. I will just go through this and uh, say that the most important thing in life is to be yourself, uh, and unless you can be somebody else. Uh, I just acknowledge a lot of people that we collaborate with uh, as the last slide, so thank you for your time, um, and uh, see you in the bar. <laughs>